Water was gone at 8.30, power was off. We're all obviously one of millions in the same boat. This is the worst ice storm that this place has taken since electricity was invented, and that's just a fact. And that is major news, so everyone across the state of Texas is being urged to conserve as much electricity as possible. This could be a treacherous day here in this state. Well, things got cold all across the state, and the power plants failed. A lot of them failed. There are 26 million people across the entire ERCOT service area. And as I recall, pretty much 80% of them lost power one way, shape, form, or another for a better part of that week. The very first call that we ran, um, first of all, it took us like two hours to get to because it was in West Austin where there are a lot of hills and our ambulance, they're really not meant to drive in the snow. We don't have four wheel drive. You know, we have to test to see how good the ambulances can function on different gradients of hills. And we found out real quick that not very well. It was the most stressful thing of my life. And I'm a 35 year battalion chief of the Austin Fire Department. Couldn't get through to 911, and they couldn't get through 311, and they were literally starving and freezing in their home. I had nightmares of the people I had to turn down that day because we just had the bandwidth to see them. I, I can still hear the phone going off over and over in my head. We were in in really dire straits in terms of the society of Texas. This morning, the humanitarian crisis in Texas is accelerating. Millions still without power or water. How can we buy water? We don't even have power. Nursing home staff in Georgetown trying to keep elderly residents warm. St. David's Hospital evacuating patients after losing water pressures. We moved some of our residents over here to this location because we were without power. And unfortunately, this location does not have water, so we're moving them to a, another location. The losses that were generated from Winter Storm Uri included more than 200 dead. Some outlets say as many as 900 died as a direct result. Carbon monoxide poisoning, accidents, uh, inability to get to healthcare. People just do not have an imagination for how many people it impacted, how many different ways it impacted people. I've been here for about 30 years and I never see nothing like this. Our whole infrastructure was so close to collapsing. Do you think ERCOT leadership needs to resign? Yes. We were four to five minutes away from losing the entirety of the ERCOT grid due to a complete system failure. It's unfathomable to think that we would be without power in this state for a week or two weeks, let alone months months it would have taken us to restart this grid. I mean, it really would have become uh, like a truly global scale humanitarian crisis at that point, given how many people live in Texas. The energy grid is a civilizational life support system. And without it, modern society collapses very quickly.
The extreme winter blast has left millions of people without power. 4.2 million still have no electricity at this hour. Moments away from a catastrophe that would have plunged Texas into a total blackout. Some are blaming frozen wind turbines. She says the wind turbines are all frozen. Windmills did all this. Our wind and our solar got shut down and, and they were uh, collectively more than 10 percent of our power grid. It's all the windmills fault, Governor Greg Abbott says. Greg Abbott's lying through his teeth when he's blaming renewables. The windmills failed like the silly fashion accessories they are and people in Texas died. The idea that frozen wind turbines blamed on Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez caused this is a preposterous lie. The right blamed renewables and the left blamed natural gas. But with an industry as complex as electricity, the answers are rarely simple. We spoke with experts far and wide, but none were as prophetic as Meredith Angwin, who spent her career in the electric sector after getting her master's degree in chemistry from the University of Chicago. Just four months before the Texas blackouts, she published a book titled Shorting the Grid, in which she laid out exactly how something like this could happen. Then, winter storm Uri slammed Texas, and our expert became an oracle. Before I began writing about energy, I was doing research on improvements for energy for power plants of various kinds, uh, geothermal power plants, coal plants, gas-fired plants, and nuclear plants. The more I learned, the more I realized the grid was getting more and more fragile, more and more expensive. Rolling blackouts in all kinds of areas were becoming more and more possible, more and more likely. The Texas grid almost collapsed because I call it the fatal trifecta for a grid, and too many grids are chasing it. The first part of the fatal trifecta, over-reliance on renewables, which go on and off when they want to. The second part, over-reliance on natural gas, which is delivered just in time and can be interrupted just in time through a variety of methods. And the third part is relying on a neighbor to help. We have overinvested in renewables and underinvested in more stable thermal generators. And why that has created unreliability problems is because renewables don't produce all the time, unlike other power plants. And so that means that they need a lot of backup. That backup is generally going to be just in time natural gas because it is, well, just in time. Now, a lot of people will say, and also they weren't connected to other grids. You know, actually, that didn't make a bit of difference because when you're connected to other grids and there's a weather crisis, those grids will not share with you. They got their own problems. People don't really understand what's going on. Their choice is being made about the grid and they're not being made very publicly. Everyone thinks energy is like any other commodity. It's the milk comes from the store mentality, but it doesn't. Somebody has to milk, feed, and take care of that cow. Uh, it's ERCOT that is responsible uh, for ensuring that, so ERCOT stands for Electric Reliability Council of Texas. And they showed that they were not reliable. Politicians, like most of us, are energy blind. We just simply don't understand energy well, intuitively, and our education doesn't remedy that defect. As a consequence, even very well-meaning politicians make dangerous mistakes about energy. For energy systems, planning is key. The system must be ready at any time to serve California's entire energy load at its peak. So I'm prepared to say that this is a failure of judgment rather than a conspiracy. Nevertheless, it's a very serious failure of judgment and I think actually reprehensible because how difficult is it to learn some basic physics and see these things? We have basically turned our electricity grid into one big Rube Goldberg machine. And we're just really hoping that as the marble knocks everything over, that means that you get to turn your lights on. The grid is becoming like a delicate wine glass that if you just touch it, might break. The energy policies that we're pursuing threaten what we take so for granted. The place that they end is with a perilous electricity system. It's hard to overstate the importance of the grid. The electric sector is among the world's biggest businesses. 
In the U.S. alone, electricity sales total about $500 billion per year. The power sector is also the world's biggest emitter of CO2. To combat emissions and address climate change, we're spending billions. But are we spending that money in the right places? And how has it impacted the integrity of the grid? The grid is like a comet in that it's something we all participate in, but nobody owns the whole thing. There is the physical grid, which is generators, transmission and distribution, and basically power plants, the lines and poles, and then the transmission systems that get them out to houses. We've got hundreds of monopoly utilities. We've got co-ops. We've got independent power producers that all contribute in some way or another to keeping the lights on. And then there's the policy grid on top of that, which are the rules and regs that govern how the physical system of the grid operates and making sure that everybody abides by the rules as they update and change. Then I would say that uh, on top of the policy grid, there is the political grid, which is this weird agglomeration of desires, ambitions, corruption, good intentions that go into creating the policy and building the physical aspects of the grid itself. It's a highly complex, highly bureaucratized process. And for all these, we have only just begun to fight. Of course, we will continue to work for cheaper electricity in the homes and on the farms of America. If we go back to the history of, of how grids were kind of put together, the old method was electric utility was totally integrated from the generator to the transmission line to the local distribution company to the meter to your bill. The approach there was to allow electric utilities to do this as a matter of public policy, but also to make sure that they made a rate of return that was not excessive. So you see, the increase of more than four to one in volume of business has meant nothing as far as profit is concerned. The way that the electrical grid works is that it's a natural monopoly, meaning that it was very early we figured out that we didn't want to have multiple companies competing to string up wire from everybody's house. That would become unworkable. It's heavily regulated so that that utility can't increase the electricity rates by too much, which would end up you know, destroying the economy because everything depends on electricity. As electricity began to make its way across America in the 19th century and, and in the early 20th century, we were all very consumed with trust and antitrust. We made sure that we could regulate these entities economically and hopefully make use of their growth to build the industrial base for the United States. American industry is making the greatest production effort in history to supply our army with ever-increasing quantities of the weapons of war. It really took off right before World War II as we began to realize that we had less electricity generation than the Axis powers. The thought that instead of spending, as some nations do, half their national income in piling up armaments and more armaments for purposes of war, we in America are wiser in using our wealth on projects like this which will give us more wealth, better living, and greater happiness for our children. We began to build hydropower plants all across the West. Power and strength from the mills, factories, and people of America. We knew that we needed electricity to basically prosecute the war effort for the United States. Electrical grids used to be designed by engineers overseen by public utilities commissions and they were very much into providing reliable affordable electricity for the people in their area 
If your utility cut power to you, then they would be fined by their Public Utilities Commission. So not serving the people actually went to their bottom line. Early in my career, I helped design cranes, right? And if you're designing a crane, and you have a decision to make the crane bigger and stronger or smaller and weaker, you always go for bigger and stronger. You don't want it falling over and killing somebody. And the grid's kind of like that. You know, if you have a decision to make the grid more reliable and more robust, that's the path you choose. That's how the electric industry grew. Reliability and affordability went hand in hand. But with the headlong rush to deregulate electricity markets across the country and reduce costs, policymakers began buying the idea that electricity was a commodity instead of a critical service. When price became more important than reliability, blackouts skyrocketed. Sergio Mark, three years since Superstorm Sandy made landfall, the disaster left millions in the dark. But what if terrorists go after our power grids? I read this book, Ted Koppel's Lights Out. His new book is called Lights Out about what would happen if the American grid went down for like months. And it came up to like, I don't know, 50, 60% of Americans would die. I mean, it's that, that stark. Millions and millions of people were caught by surprise when the electrical grid suddenly crashed. I have a feeling that people think that if we didn't have electricity, well, then we'd talk more, we'd sit around the wood stove and chat. Well, no, you'd eat less. There'd be more canned food and less fresh food. There's so many things there just wouldn't be about our health and so forth. It's all much more dependent on the grid than we want to think about it being dependent. You know, it's not just a way to power our iPhones and television sets. The electrical grid is necessary for hospitals. It's necessary for traffic lights. You know, your wastewater treatment plants need electricity. Your drinking water is delivered by electricity. Your gas stations, the pumps don't work without electricity. We don't have the economy. We don't have educational system. We don't have uh, health care. Anybody can make it more difficult to keep it stable, more difficult to provide power in a reliable manner, more expensive, can game it by taking a couple plants offline and watching the clearing price soar. Taking plants offline in the old grid didn't do you any good. In the new grid, it does. That new grid Meredith's talking about wasn't designed to prioritize consumers. The old grid, the one built by people like Edison, Insull, and others, ensured reliability because if electricity isn't reliable, it's not affordable. Expensive energy is the enemy of the poor. So why has our most important energy network been weakened? Who's responsible? And what can we do to fix it?